inside of your sign. Can you change the inside of your sign? So basically, can I change the x squared? Never. Can't change that thing unless you use uh, identity. That's the only time you can do that. You can't just say, I think I'll pull an x out and put it there. No, you can't. No, no you don't. What you want to do is make it so that, if you haven't noticed this in the previous two examples, make it so this angle matches your denominator. What do you need to multiply by to make your angle match your denominator? Because that's what we did here. Right. Multiply to make your angle equal to your denominator. Multiply to make your angle equal to your denominator. That's where the 5 came from. What do you need to multiply by? X over X. X over X would work. So keeping with what we know, this x, I can't do much with that besides put it out in front of my limit. So right here I'll do, okay, I'm going to put that out in front. But these two, yes, that's what I want. Because what, what I want, I want that angle and that denominator to be exactly the same. You alright with this so far? Now because limits are separable by multiplication, I can say, well, this is just multiplication. I can separate off a limit of x. So this would be a limit of x as x approaches 0 times a limit sine x squared over x squared as x approaches 0. Hey, tell me something. What's the limit of x as x approaches 0? It's not x. Zero, because you plug that in, you get zero. Times, what's the limit of sine x squared over x squared as x approaches zero? One. One, yeah, because you can make the same substitution like we well, I had on the board earlier for a dummy variable equals x squared, right? And then as x squared goes to zero, so does that variable. And so does this, uh, this variable, it would be like a u, u would be going to zero as these two things also went to zero. That matches our, our identity perfectly. This goes to one. And as I've said, any time your angle matches up with your denominator, you can do that. So as you pull up that x, it has to be the limit as x. Absolutely. Okay. Because it's not a constant. It's not a constant. Okay. Yeah, the only reason that that's a great point, the only reason why we were able to pull this constant out and leave it <coughs> a constant is because if you did this, watch this, if you did the limit as x approaches 0 of that constant, What's the limit of 2? No matter what you're going to, right? That's why we can do it. OK, let's continue on with this. What's 0 times 1? Our limit of x squared over x, the sine x squared over x is x approaches 0 is 0. We'll try. Uh, try a few more of these. I really want to make sure you get a handle on this because there's a lot of different combinations of problems we can do. So I'm going to give you as many as I can in the time that we have. That way you feel a little bit more comfortable in your homework. You ready for them? So again, some other examples. <coughs> hey, by the way, is this the same thing as this? No. This is the same as that. No. Sine of x squared is the same thing as sine squared x. What's sine squared x mean? Good. Maybe you can see where this is going. So that's true. You're always trying to break it into limits you know, limits you understand. What's the limit of sine x over x? One. This is going to give you 1. What's sine x? What's the limit of sine x as x approaches 0? Zero? Zero. It's 0, because when you plug in the 0, you get 0. So this is ultimately going to be 1 times 0, or 0. This limit, if I, I'm not showing you a step right here, I'm not actually breaking them up. If I were to break them up, the limit of this would be 1, the limit of this would be 0, 1 times 0 is 0.
that one. Now we, we're going to talk about this. I'm not going to prove to you why it doesn't exist. You can you can uh, get there on your own, or or you can look. I think the book has a proof in it. It's pretty good. I'm going to do this graphically just to show you what this looks like. Now, of course, sine is an oscillating function, right? It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And one of x, as you get close to zero, goes to infinity, right? It goes there very fast. So what happens with this graph? It looks like this. Sure, it tops out at one and it tops out at negative one because sine is bounded in those ranges. This looks something like this. It starts off nice, it goes down, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And as it gets closer, it goes faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And faster. So a bunch of crap happens. Right? So <laughs> by the end, by the time it gets to zero, it's so like that. Does it ever get to zero? No. You tell me, can you plug in zero? Then it never gets there. It's undefined at that point. You can't do it. You cannot do it. So it just goes nice and slow and then faster, 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 faster until it gets nowhere. The other side looks like this. As we get closer to zero, are you approaching a certain point? Or is it just continuing to oscillate like that? It's not actually reaching a point. It's not gonna. It's not gonna ultimately go. Oh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna level out and make zero. Or I'm gonna level out and make. It's not doing that. As you get closer, it's still oscillating even faster and faster and faster. By the end, it's just crazy. All right, you can't even. You can't see it. It's going so fast. So, is the limit gonna exist? The answer is no. No, it doesn't exist. That one does not exist. Sine of one over x does. If you ever see that, just sine of one over x. That doesn't exist. Okay, so question. This is an interesting question. If that doesn't exist, Does that exist? Does that exist? Oh, as we approach. <laughs> Let me get my white cat and stroke it. Did you see that commercial with that creepy guy with the white cat? I don't know what that was. Yeah, it was, but it was like on the Super Bowl. I think it was uh, CeeLo. Do you know who CeeLo is? <laughs> I was made, I was forced to watch The Voice last night. That's all I Forced? Forced. Yeah. Not like handcuffed or anything, but like it was on, and of course if it's on I have to watch it, so it is. Anyway, does that exist? Let me show you something. Again, we're going to use the squeeze theorem. Are we going to prove the squeeze theorem? No. No, we're going to use the squeeze theorem. Check this out. This is interesting. Uh, do you agree that, oh, by the way, I did make a mistake on the previous squeeze theorem, using the squeeze theorem. Um, I was supposed to have the equal signs underneath it. I neglected that for some reason. I don't know why I did that. Uh, but with your squeeze theorem, you do have to have those symbols, not those symbols. I think I said it towards the very last bit of the proof. I said, you know what, I'm supposed to have these everywhere, uh, but I don't know if you caught that. Let's use some of our knowledge about sine to create some bounds on sine. Forget the 1 over x part for a second. <coughs> What's the maximum value you can attain with sine? What's the highest sine goes? <coughs> 1. What's the lowest sine goes? So you agree that's true, right? True? Okay. We'll check this out. I'm now going to create this in here by multiplying all three of these sections by x. Is that legal to do? Sure. Yeah. So if I multiply by x, actually I think I, yeah I do, I want the absolute value of x because I don't want to change those signs so I'm going to make sure I, I multiply by the absolute value of x. Okay, so here's a slightly better interpretation of what's actually going on in the problem we're working on right here. We're trying to work on the limit as x approaches zero of sine 
1 over x times x. Now, of course, we know that sine is bound between 1 and negative 1. Sine doesn't get any bigger than 1. It doesn't get any less than negative 1. So we can go naturally make this inequality. Any sine function is between negative 1 and 1, including sine of 1 over x. So we have that down. Can't get bigger than 1. Can't get less than negative 1. Now, the way we make the jump from here to here, which in class I have absolute value around this x, and I said we can get there by multiplying this absolute value of x, and this absolute value of x, and this absolute value of x, which is true, but it doesn't quite give us back exactly what we want, which is x without the absolute value. How we get there is just by a little bit of little rational thought. So we say, if we multiply by x in all three spots, what could potentially happen is, if I don't have these absolute values, I could get a negative number over here, which wouldn't be an upper bound. So what we're saying is, let's make this one absolute value of x, that way we know that that's always going to be positive. No matter what I plug in, I have a positive x. Well, that's certainly going to be bigger than x sine of 1 over x. If this is true, then this has to be true where x is positive. Also, if we let x be negative, we're going to have to have a lower bound. Now, if I don't have this absolute value, what that says is a negative times a negative could actually get me a positive. I don't want that to happen. I want a legitimate lower bound. So that's where the absolute value is coming from. That says, all right, well then x sine of 1 over x certainly has to be bigger than that negative number. If this inequality is true, then this one also has to be true. And that makes our double inequality here. From there, it's a simple matter of limits. We say, well, we know the limit as x approaches 0 of the absolute value of x. That's going to 0. We know that that's at that's that v-curve as we're going from both sides. The height of that function is getting down to 0. So that limit exists at 0. Same thing, the limit of negative absolute value of x. That's negative absolute value of x. We're going up to a height of 0 from both sides. That limit's 0. So we have the limit of this function is 0. The limit of this function is 0. Since we've now squeezed our function we wanted to find out, this one, since we've squeezed that between two functions whose limit is 0 as we approach 0, by the squeeze theorem, we can now draw that conclusion. That's how we get the limit as x approaches 0 of x sine of 1 over x equals 0. Does the limit only exist because you have an x in front of this sine 1 over x? Yeah. And which is interesting, because that little that x right there in front of it allows you to bound it between two numbers and then use that fact to say the limit of this goes to something, the limit of this goes to something. The, the problem is, if you look at this one, just the negative 1 sine 1 over x, less than 1. Where's this limit go? Where's this limit go? Are they the same? Then you haven't squeezed it. That's the problem. We needed that x to say, OK, by multiplying by well, ab the absolute value of x, which is, which is a small point, but multiply by the absolute value of x, the limit of the absolute value of x, yes, that is going to 0. And the absolute value of x, yes, that is going to 0. That is what actually squeezes it. That's the point. Without the x, you can't do it. It fails here. It, it doesn't work here. It works here. This is another one that we can use. Limit of x sine x or sine one over x that does exist. It actually equals zero. It's an interesting thing just by having that x in there. So our whole idea for this is you're trying to break up these limits into the identities that you, the limit identities that we can work with, the ones we already know. That's the uh, sine x over x goes to one, and the one minus cosine x over x goes to zero, and the tan x over x goes to one again. That's